NextFest is a promotional event on Steam where they stream a whole bunch of upcoming games and I think every one of those games included in the fest has a playable demo, which I think is wonderful. I think that every game should have a demo, basically, and I think that it would really help to boost sales in a lot of cases, but obviously there are plenty of reasons why that's not the reality we live in, but in case you feel overwhelmed by the sheer number of games at NextFest or you just haven't heard anything about any of these games, games at all. I'm here to talk about the demos that I played for nine different Next Fest games, and I've even placed them in order of how excited I am for each one, from not so excited to, yeah, I'm basically ready to buy, let's just do this already. And a quick note on the footage, the gameplay footage for each of the games I'll be speaking about is stuff that I captured from the demos. Obviously these are demo builds, some of them are alpha builds. These are not finished products, so please don't judge them as finished games is not what they are. Also, my impressions are based on demos, not the full games. Just want to get that out of the way. Now, I was not able to record footage for the Rift Breaker. It just didn't work out. The footage was trash, so I'll instead be using footage from uh, one of the trailers for that game. Okay, let's get going. So this is a remake of a platformer for the Master System back in the 80s. The story and gameplay is pretty basic, but the most alluring aspect of the upcoming DX release is the visuals. I love the pixel art in this game, and I know that we've been treated to a whole bunch of wonderful pixel art from the indie scene over the years in very different styles, but here, this stuff is just my taste for more cartoony games. They did a lovely job. Whoever, the team who put together the pixel art for this thing, bravo, I'm clapping, but I can't clap because of the microphone. You did a wonderfully. It's really fantastic. However, like a lot of remakes of retro video games, it doesn't seem like they updated very much about the core design or gameplay, which some people might prefer. Some people might say that makes for a good and faithful remake. But in this case, for me, it's pretty frustrating. Alex, your character, dies in one hit, just like Crash, and you do get several lives, which will restart you fairly close to where you died, which is nice. And then once you run out of lives, you start the level over. Pretty standard fare. There is an option in the menu to enable infinite lives. So that's something on the accessibility front. It's also hard to tell what you can hit and what you can't. As Alex, what you can punch, even just breaking blocks, which is a major part of the game, it can be weird when trying to combine Alex's punch with his jump. When you're on a flat surface, the punch feels fine. But while jumping, the punch just doesn't feel good for some reason, especially when the jump and the punch are both mapped to face buttons. It just feels awkward to me to pull it off the way I want to. The demo also includes two vehicle-based levels where you can purchase vehicles which you get to ride around until they break apart. But even with that, you won't know right off the bat what does and does not break the vehicles. So when you're riding around on the little scooter thing, it's these red balls that break the scooter. But I don't know what these balls are supposed to represent. So you basically just have to learn by failing. Again, not not an absolute negative in terms of game design, but not something that I particularly enjoy, especially when the visual language doesn't seem to be communicating important information. In other words, I have a feeling that a lot of these little quirks are indeed present in the original game, but choosing to include them here is a little bit confusing to me. I don't think they make the game more fun, and since you don't have many options to change things around in terms of how the game plays, if you don't happen to like these quirks, you're just going to be stuck with them. The Rift Breaker is basically Factorio. And I know that's a bit much. I don't want to oversimplify. It definitely has its own identity, especially when it comes to story and the visuals. The visuals can be quite nice in this game, actually. And I'm sure that there were games at least somewhat similar to Factorio long before that game was released. But having played a lot of Factorio recently, it's hard for me not to notice the similarities. The art direction between the two games is very different. But outside of that, they are both top-down, base-built, 
building automation games with similar feeling combat and exploration, and even mining resources and powering your structures is basically the same, at least in concept. I don't think Riftbreaker has conveyor belts or automation arms, and in general, I don't think that the automation possibilities in this game are anywhere as deep as those in Factorio. Riftbreaker also seems to focus much more on combat. Just in the tutorial, you have to clear out nests and take down a, a kind of like mini boss, I guess we could call it. So it's more actiony overall, but I couldn't help compare it to other games. And you know what? I'll just let other folks compare and contrast for themselves. I don't want to say they're the, the exact same game, but ultimately, at the end of the day, they gave me similar experiences, I suppose. Glimmer in Mirror. It's a Metroidvania in 2D with some platformer elements and some kind of story featuring some chibi anime characters that reminded me very much of Lapis Labyrinth in their design. It's a hand-drawn art style and more than anything I enjoyed the backgrounds and environments more than the character designs themselves. By the end of the demo I had a basic attack, a charge attack, and a few partial collectibles that I'm guessing would eventually give me power-ups. The controls feel decent, though it didn't let me use the d-pad for some reason. I think that would have felt better, but it's a demo, who knows. And I don't have too much else to say about it. The most negative impression came from the text and the dialogue. The game has not been translated very well at all at this point. And again, it's a demo, and the game is in early access currently, so I guess it's fine. The team also makes it clear that they are accepting feedback, so hopefully they can get that bit of the game straightened out. It's not that I feel like I'm missing out on some incredible story, but I do think the game would benefit from a solid English translation. I saw this game shown off during E3 in one of the conferences, I don't remember, and I've been eager to try it out. So after going through the demo, well, most of the demo anyway, my impressions are a bit mixed. The combat here feels impactful and responsive, especially with the male character, I don't remember his name. Soon enough, you meet up with the female character, I think she's his sister, I don't know, and suddenly the game trains you to switch between the two and even move them around at the same time, solving basic puzzles along the way. And that's the part that's started to throw me. If they were going to force you to use a specific character for one area or another, I would be fine with that. They both feel unique and of course have different attacks and platforming styles, but using them in tandem to solve puzzles especially didn't feel good to me. It makes for an interesting challenge, and I'm sure the full game will have some very compelling iterations of this mechanic, but when it became clear that Greek would definitely be heading into puzzle platformer territory, I started to lose interest. That it's just not my thing. And obviously I'm not speaking about the full game, I don't know what they'll end up doing, but personally, having puzzle platformy stuff on top of fairly meaty combat doesn't feel very good to me. That said, I'll probably still buy it once it's released. <laughs> They Always Run is one of those 2D action platformers that really wants to make you feel cool, mostly through flashy combat. When playing the demo, I got hints of Katana Zero, My Friend Pedro, Ruiner, and Guacamelee. Combat is actually quite deep, with lots of room for personalization and impressive moves. The big combat mechanic is your third arm, which is used by holding a bumper and moving the right stick. The third arm is definitely the one attack that feels very impactful. In comparison, your standard attack feels extremely weak and ineffective. Blocking and countering is a huge part of combat as well, and it feels great to pull off successfully. The art direction is attractive, and I'm not expecting too much from the story, honestly. Overall, it's alright. I think some talented people are gonna just go ham on this one and show us some really impressive combat. <laughs> Terra Nil is a devolver game from the team behind Broforce, which was a pretty tough action side-scroller loaded up with goofy movie references. This one is a very different beast. It's essentially a resource management game and base builder, I suppose, with a huge emphasis on conservation. Like many city builders and management games, you have very limited resources to start out, and you have to find a way to use those resources to achieve a list of objectives. 
At least that's the gameplay loop in the tutorial. Maybe the full game will be more open, but I kind of doubt it. One type of resource is your currency, but the landscape itself is another very important resource. You can revitalize and alter that landscape in different ways, adding water to canals, digging new canals, changing topography, and even performing controlled burns. There's a lot, and I'm sure that there will be many more tools and functions beyond what they give us here. It wasn't long at all before I realized that this is basically a puzzle game. An open-ended puzzle game, sure, but still a puzzle game. Or maybe calling it a strategy game would be more accurate. It's not about being free to build whatever you want for purely aesthetic reasons. It's about completing your objectives with whatever resources you have or can purchase. Even in the demo, things got pretty tricky, and I had to try several different approaches to move forward. At first, I felt disappointed with the puzzly aspect because I tend to enjoy management games as a form of creative expression. Zoo Tycoon and Cities Skylines let me make my very own creations, and it feels great. But I also understand that the puzzle or strategy components make perfect sense for the overall theme of the game. It's about conservation. Of course you're not going to be free to build whatever you want. Every action has an impactful consequence, and you need to think creatively to win. A very neat game. I don't know whether I'll be playing the full version, but I, I do honestly really like the idea. So the Blaster Master series, which I keep calling Master Blaster in my head thanks to Mad Max, is an action series that's been around since the late 1980s, and it's seen some re-releases in recent years, and in the case of Master Blaster Master 03, brand new releases. Is this one secretly a remake as well? I don't think so, it's kind of confusing to go back through the history of the series. So I tried out a demo of Blaster Master 02 on Switch a while back, and I was shocked by just how much fun it was, despite the degree to which it felt like a retro side-scroller, which I don't usually go for that much. Based on this demo, the game is fun. It's more Blaster Master, basically. I don't know whether the top-down sections are new for the series, but I enjoyed them quite a bit, probably because I'm typically more comfortable with top-down action games than 2D platformers. The primary sections of the game consist of driving around in your tank, which has its own set of weapons and abilities, and then running around outside of the tank. Then you have the top-down sections where you're just the little character guy, but with a ton of different weapons that are pretty fun to try out. These mechanics have been echoed in numerous contemporary games that are trying to invoke retro action games. Gato Roboto forces you to switch between a mech suit and a powerless cat, and Panzer Paladin also makes you, or lets you, switch between a mech suit and a little character. The music is excellent, and overall, it feels really good to play. Nothing too challenging right off the bat, so hopefully it won't scare off new players. Bear and Breakfast has been one of my most anticipated indies for a long time. It got showed off in a Nintendo indie showcase at some point, and I just loved the basic concept of running a B&B &B as a friendly bear. <laughs> the story elements here are actually much more substantial than I expected, and I'm curious to find out whether they really develop these threads or if they're just meant to get you into the game world. But apparently humans in this universe know about talking animals, and they're fine with it. I initially thought you would have to sneak around your guests so that they don't know that a bear is running the place, <laughs> or maybe even disguise yourself as a person very poorly. I just think that would be pretty funny. The devs are being playful, and that makes perfect sense for this type of game. The management mechanics actually seem pretty in-depth, with predictable ways to find out what guests need, and plenty of room for customization and purely aesthetic choices. One of my favorite bits is that to cut down on the negative effect of the noise that the heater makes is to surround it with decorative objects, which I guess just conceptually absorb some of the annoying sounds. It's funny, and it also makes sense in a weird way. In just 30 minutes or so, I got the sense that the game could really suck me in for the long term, and I'm interested to see how difficult the game gets once you're at capacity. Can you construct new buildings? Does the story just end after a certain point? Lots of potential here, and I hope they don't end up charging 30 bucks for it, because I don't think I could afford that. This is a cool game. I had never heard of it previously. I'm, I'm kind of taken aback. I hope this isn't too off topic, but my creative background is in writing, specifically fiction writing, some journalism. And for anyone who's read just a bunch of fiction short stories before, or like uh, personal essays, you'll understand exactly what I mean when I say that this game feels like a unique and interesting way 
to tell a story, the kind of approach that you might find in a, a really creative short story. I could absolutely see this premise being used by someone like Amy Bender or, or Joan Didion or Amy Hempel. It's a very passive style of storytelling, but it's still very effective. You can learn a lot about a person from their stuff, and that's what unpacking is all about. It's the tiny details that really make this work on the game side. Well, that and the visuals, which are fantastic. This art direction is basically perfect. There are so many tiny little items here that reflect real life. These are things you would pack. Probably some items aren't in the right boxes for the room you're currently in, which is a thing that just happens when you're packing in real life too. The objects evolve as time moves forward, and many of the items will feel especially relatable to someone in their 20s and older. When you unpack a tube of toothpaste, it's clearly partially used, and for some reason that kind of detail just feels really wonderful to me. The game, even just the demo, manages to capture the strange, unique, intimidating, and exciting window of time when you've just moved into a new place. It's not a moment that lasts very long at all, but it's an incredibly interesting one in terms of emotional palette. Another beautiful aspect on display here is how every item is placed in a very satisfying way with excellent sound. can only place things at right angles, which pleases my lingering OCD. The only real gamey aspect so far is that you can't put items just anywhere you want. Once you have every item unpacked and placed, the game will tell you which items need to be moved. It won't tell you where to put them because there isn't just one right answer, but you just need to try out some different spots to see what works. My god, I mean, even the animations of folding up the empty boxes is gorgeous. Somebody put real work into that, and I I really do appreciate it. I can't speak to how satisfied people will be with this as a game, but as an experience, as an activity, I can see myself going through it again and again. And if they manage to cram in tons of levels and plenty of objects, I think I could even get a decent amount of playtime out of it. And that brings us to a close here. Thank you for joining me for this very brief look at nine different games that have shown up in the Next Fest event on Steam. Again, the whole point here is that every one of them has a demo. I don't know how long these demos will be available, but I highly recommend that if there's something that sparked your interest, go ahead and check it out right now. Take a look on Steam. Also, in case you're someone who's not super into PC gaming and you don't have this really capable giant rig that cost $5,000 to build, the vast majority of these games will run on even lower end systems. The only one that I had trouble running on my somewhat beefy PC was Rift Breaker for some reason. Maybe it just hasn't been optimized yet. I was really getting a lot of frame drops. Highly recommend checking it out, even if you're not into gaming at all, really. This, especially stuff like Unpacking or Baron Breakfast, totally worth a shot for just about anyone. Anyway, I guess that's about it. Please let me know in the comment section as per usual if there's other stuff you would like to hear about, if there are other games in Next Fest that you just thought were cool, but I guess that's about it. Thanks for stopping by.